Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos and today we're going to talk about the building behind me, the Brewers Exchange, or what I sometimes call the wedding cake building for obvious reasons. I just want to say though before we jump in um, that it's the time of the year that normally at Baltimore Heritage would be starting our neighborhood walking tour series. Um, again this year we are canceling that out of uh, an abundance of caution but we have started in-person tours at Greenmount Cemetery and as the spring and summer roll along I'm sure roll along I'm sure we're going to expand those so hang in there with us please and stay tuned um, and thanks once again for all of those uh, who have supported us over the last year and all those folks uh, considering a gift thank you sincerely all right the Brewers Exchange um, built in 1896 for Baltimore's German brewers they were mostly a German lot back then um, and it was built as a place where uh, the German brewers could exchange and negotiate over things like the price of hops or barley or, or beer brewing things like that but it was really more in the style of the old world, the European Craft Guild, um, where even though people were economic competitors, they would come together, uh, maybe a little cooperation could lead to some good, and especially lead to keeping the influence of outsiders out of their profession. Outsiders in this case might be the state of Maryland trying to impose a new tax on breweries. That's not a good thing if you're a brewer. Or it could be the new kid in town who's trying to undersell you on the price of Bavarian hops. And if you're the sole supplier of Bavarian hops in Baltimore, that's not a good thing. Um, but it also acted as a way that members could get together and say resolve disputes without having to hire costly lawyers. Um, so really in that old world style. Our brewers group uh, got its start before 1896. I think it had been going by about the 1860s. That's when the National Brewers Association got going and held one of its first uh, annual conferences here in Baltimore. It held its other an annual conferences, uh, early ones, incidentally, in other German beer brewing cities like Cincinnati and St. Louis and Milwaukee, not surprising. But by 1896, the brewers here banded together and hired the preeminent architect, or one of them of his day, Joseph Evans Sperry who designed, among other thing, notable things, uh, Temple Oheb Shalom on Utah Place and the wonderful St. Mark's Lutheran Church with its Byzantine interior um, in old, the old Goucher neighborhood. And then one you'll definitely know, um, our own version of the Plaza Vecchia, the Bromo Seltzer Tower just around the corner here. Um, so speaking of architecture, this building, which is uh, Renaissance Revival, is really known as one of Baltimore's uh, best examples of terracotta work in the city. Um, the wonderful balustrade at the top is terracotta. Um, the, uh, the ring of uh, fruits and vases around the top, that's terracotta. The first floor is terracotta. The tops of the columns are terracotta. And if you're wondering, they are ionic columns, ionic terracotta columns. Um, all of that is terracotta. One thing I found interesting is that the window surrounds, they're of course terracotta, um, but they are uh, the motifs are not beer brewing motifs. Um, they are uh, none other than uh, grapes and grape leaves. Um, so if you are a wine over beer fan, you can kind of count one in the victory column uh, here at the Brewers Exchange. Um, one, we know, for example, where uh, Joseph Evans Sperry, the architect, got his uh, motivation for the Bromo Seltzer Tower. Um, the indomitable owner, Captain Isaac Emerson, had gotten back from Florence and said, hey, architect Sperry, build me one of those here. So we know where he got his uh, motivation there. We don't so much on this uh, for this building, um, but there is a researcher uh, who I don't know, Edward Perlman, who back in the 1980s did some wonderful work and uh, does a pretty good job of connecting this building um, with Somerset House in England. Sperry, as a good architect, had, had a copy of a book called The Encyclopedia of Architecture by a gentleman named Joseph Gwilt. It was a sort of a how-to manual for architects of the day in the 1880s, 90s, early 1900s. And um, in it, uh, there was a plate, a uh, big full-color plate of Somerset House, which was built in 1663, I believe, by a British architect, the first British architect, Inigo Jones. Um, and if you hold the two sides side by side, well, you can draw your own conclusion on where a Sperry probably got his motivation. And I'll help you out uh, because uh, Mr. Perlman also notes that in that book, that Art Encyclopedia of Architecture, um, there's a chapter on how to do crown molding, plaster crown molding, um, and he gives you five examples of it, and one of those five is pretty much copied piece for piece here on the inside of that main uh, big room on the first floor, down to the lotus leaf motifs. 
So we're pretty sure, take a look at Somerset House, that's where he got his motivation. Um, by 1896, the brewers had moved in back to the building. By 1906, they had moved out. Baltimore's brewing scene had changed dramatically. Um, a number of small brewers, we had over two dozen at one point, had consolidated down to just a handful of big brewers. In uh, 1898, for example, 17 breweries combined into the American brewery. So we lost 17 in one fell swoop there. Um, by 1906, the brewers had sold. I guess the ones left could meet at a small lunch table. They didn't need a building. But they sold. The Mercantile Bank had it for a while. Kanabe Piano had it for a while. It was a Ford dealer for a while. Then went through a number of commercial uses, like uh, uh, optometrists and shoe stores, I believe. And by 1984, we're lucky that a firm called Murdoch Company, Murdoch Development Company, bought it and did a fantastic job restoring it. And even put it on the, got it listed on the National Register of historic places. Um, today it's owned by a firm, uh, a law firm called Ingerman and Horowitz, um, and they have also been incredible stewards of the building. Um, they did, and some of you may remember this, about a year, year and a half ago, they got into a little bit of hot water. They were repainting the building as a good steward would, so that's uh, wonderful. Um, and in the process, the painters had uh, scrubbed it down and done the uh, work they needed, and then painted a primer coat that looked like sort of a brown mud color. And as it was drying and the days went on, the panic level in Baltimore rose, um, including, I'll admit, me. And I thought, oh no, the wedding cake building is turning brown. Um, the law firm put out a statement that basically said, hold on everybody, it's just a primer. Uh, we'll get it to white in a minute. And that they did. So uh, come on down, take a look at this wonderful 1906 building. See if you can spot the, uh, the Vintner's uh, uh, motifs on this brewing building um, and marvel at its terracotta work. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.